Welcome to the Agent Progression Podcast. We're your hosts, Brandon Baca. And I'm R.L. Hessen. And we're building your real estate business from the ground up. Okay, episode 001, and we're going to ask you guys to give us a break on this one because we're just figuring this thing out and we're going to build it as we go, which, you know, R.L., as I was thinking about it this morning, is a really good lesson for getting started in real estate because you're not going to know what you're doing. You are going to be confused. Uh, There's going to be this flood of new information coming at you. And so the answer or or how you figure this thing out is you just got to, you have to get started. You just have to start somewhere and we're going to figure it out along the way. Um, So just like this podcast, you want to think about your real estate business the same way. Just start doing things right um, uh, listen to your broker, listen to your real estate coach, listen to, um, the people that are around you that want the best for you that, that, uh, are going to help you move forward. Yeah. I mean, how many weeks did we, we talk about this months? Uh, no, or? no. It's probably been over a year that we've yeah. talked about doing this podcast and we've been kind of bogged down and, in, in uh, creating a, a lot of new things with, uh, real estate brokerage. Uh, so I'm the founder of uh, Ten Oaks Real Estate, um, a brokerage that's based in Franklin, Tennessee, with locations in Oklahoma and Texas. Um, right now, somewhere around 140 agents. Um, and uh, RL, do you want to say say uh, or give your origin a yes. little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm currently serving as the chief strategy officer at Ten Oaks with Brandon Baca. Uh, he and I met, and we'll we'll talk about that story in a bit. Um, but I'm also uh, an executive for a Fortune 500 company. Um, I've been in technology leadership for you know 15 years or so now, and uh, you know making the shift into real estate. I've been a real estate investor for a long time, and and Brandon and I will get into our backgrounds here in a bit. But um, right now, I'm I'm a technology executive, and and then currently helping Brandon out over at Ten Oaks. Yeah, and it's been uh, it's been a fun ride, and um, we're excited about the future, uh, even in sort of a. a market shift, which, you know, the the time this podcast is starting, it is October of 2022. We're post-pandemic. Um, and, you know, there's a, definitely a market adjustment. Um, and so even with all of that turmoil going on in the world, we're super excited about the things that we've got going on and, and moving forward. But um, let's shift gears and talk about origins. Um, and, and I'm going to give my story. So I grew up in a small town, North Texas, Sherman, Texas, a uh, town of about um, twenty to 30,000 people. And, um, you know, joined the Marines right out of high school, um, joined the Marine Reserves. Uh, I made an attempt at going to college. It did not, did not work out like I planned. I think I have a combination of nine hours from three different colleges. Um, but uh, my wife and I uh, uh, met shortly thereafter, got married, um, and... You know, we had started our life in Oklahoma City, uh, you know, me as a, a salesperson for a paint company in Oklahoma City. And um, so I got to this place where, hey, I think I've got everything going in the right direction. I um, got a decent career off the ground and and uh, was sales rep with, you know, a company trunk and a company credit card. And that was, you know, everything that I had ever hoped for in in getting a career and we had just bought a house, and I got orders to deploy to Iraq in 2004. Um, and so I, I went to Iraq, and and by the way, we had just found out, as as like the same month that we found out we were pregnant, <laughs> well, I got orders to deploy. So left, came home to a four-month-old little girl, and life was different. Um, uh, you know, that, that experience changes you, it shapes you. Um, but the other thing that sort of simultaneously happened is that we had uh, three more kids very quickly. So we had four kids in under five years. And um, all of a sudden, that paint sales career wasn't bringing home enough money. It, it was it was a pretty decent paying job, but it wasn't four kids um, uh, income. And so I was looking for opportunities and, and found my way into real estate uh, because I thought, well, if I'm making 3%... A commission on a bucket of paint. Why not sell the most expensive thing that I can sell? Which uh, you know, I thought, well, that's houses. So that got me interested. Um, I used um, at that time um, the president had just uh, kicked back a surplus, so I got about eighteen hundred bucks, and so I used that money 
to get to go to real estate school, to get my real estate license, get affiliated with the MLS, all that stuff, and and launch my career. Did you um, did you have any any connections from the paint industry that helped you out in real estate? <laughs> I would like to think so, but but not really initially. However, though, now, now I say that one of my friends, um, who was the manager of the paint company uh, or the paint store that I was working for, introduced me to my mentor in real estate. And that's how we got connected. And, um, so, so yes, I mean, in, in that sense, he had left the paint company and, and, um, you know, I got, uh, got connected through a, his new boss. Um, but I mean, I know you, our, our audience doesn't know you. I mean, I know you're selling everywhere you go, so I'm, I'm sure <laughs> you probably reached back out to a few people, maybe sold a house or two. Tell us the truth. I mean, you, you had, you used your connections wisely. Uh, I mean, as much as I could, I mean, yeah. I leveraged my yeah. connections as much as I could. Um, but I'm, I maybe wasn't as bold as I should have been, uh, you know, at the very beginning or, or as hungry as I should have been. Cause I still had that pain income and I was working real estate part-time. And, um, so I did it part-time for three years. I, I, my first year, I, I had my first listing with then because of my mentor and he was, he was great in teaching me how to, how to get my business off the ground. But I had my first listing within two weeks of getting my real estate license and it was for $72,000. Big money. Yeah, big money. But I was so happy to have a sign in someone's yard with my name on it. I didn't care. I mean, I was like, I made it. Um, and so uh, that that was pretty fun. And it was actually happened to be a house that I, you know, I had a daily, um, a daily routine where I would sort of make a run on this particular street, and and the house was listed on that street, and so I got to run by my real estate sign. <laughs> Every day. As a matter of fact, I think that encouraged me to work out so that I would go see that real estate sign every day. You probably did more work on that $72,000 house than you did on any other <laughs> listing exactly you ever had. exactly right, yeah. man. Open houses. I mean, I was just on top of it. And that was not an easy time in real estate. No, this was 2008, August of 2008 is when I got my real estate license. So definitely not, a, it not was, an easy uh, time. Yeah, and, and, uh, but I didn't know any better. Yeah. You know? Of course. Um, I, I was listening to a... a a podcast recently, they were talking about, you know, or, you know, we're in this recession and they were talking about, well, um, you know, this particular business wasn't in a recession. It was a mindset thing, but I thought, well, I wasn't in a recession. Any sort of money that I made in real estate was on top of my income. So I wasn't in a recession. Right. Um, so I didn't know any better. I was like, Hey, I'm, it's great. I got a sign in the yard. And, um, and so I was happy. So you've got your license now, you got your first listing. Where yes. do we go from here? Yeah. So, uh, after that, basically, my first year, I made like eight thousand dollars in in extra income, which at the time, for somebody who's making you know fifty thousand dollars a year, that was a substantial raise. I mean, it's yeah. it's an eight percent raise, which anybody would want that. Um, and it gave me some breathing room because one of the things is we were always we had too much month at the end of the money, and so to be able to put some money in savings and not to have a panic attack every time something broke at the house was huge. Blessing. So the first year I made $8,000, second year I made $16,000. Third year I go, all right, I, I think I've got this figured out. I'll quit and go full time. And then I think I made $75,000 my first full time year, which is 2011, and then made six figures from then on out. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of my career. Um, worked with that real estate business and, and grew it to about. Um, 350 to 400 agents over about a nine year period and then left that company, um, in 2019, um, to start, uh, in November of 2019 to start 10 Oaks. And, uh, yeah, another great time to start a business yeah. because I, yeah, I've got a great track record of, uh, of this yeah. because I started in November, 2019, of course, you know, February of 2020 was the pandemic, uh, came on strong and, uh, we were sort of like, are we going to make it? But, um, and you, yeah. and you've relocated now to Franklin. Yes, that's right. So, so I was, yeah, that previous business, sorry, I, I missed that part. So that previous business, I moved, uh, to, uh, Nashville or Franklin to launch an expansion of that business. Um, and so, yeah, I had relocated at that time. And so when we started the new business, we started in Franklin, Tennessee. So that was, yeah, from Oklahoma city to, to Nashville. So it's not only starting a new business and probably not the best time to start a new business, but starting it with basically no contacts here. I mean, you, had, you, know, you had a few friends. Yeah. I remember I had a really close family friend who said, uh, so you're moving to Nashville. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, do you know anybody there? And I go, no. And they go, I, I don't understand how you do that. 
if I remember talking to Andrea, your wife, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you guys were, you just drove through Nashville and you said, it looks nice. I'd, I'd like to live here. Yeah. It was pretty much that we, we were on our way to Pennsylvania to visit some family and we came to Franklin and we ended up spending an extra day here. We fell in love with Franklin. And, and so we thought, well, let's, let's make a plan to move there. Um, we were needing to do some expansion for that real estate company at the time anyway. So it's like, let's, let's just go ahead and do it. Looks like a good place to do it. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and, and uh, you know, to be fair, Nashville was really growing at that time. I mean, it's, it, it was, yeah. It, it, Nashville is a, you know, fantastic real estate market. It's a growing city. And so, um, you know, fortunately, but you know, I honestly think with good work ethic, you can work your way into the top 10% of production anywhere. Yeah. Um, most people who are, uh, who have a, a strong work ethic and work hard, you sort of know this. It's like, well, look, um, whether the market is competitive or not, if you have that individual work ethic, you can work your way up. I mean, what do we say all the time at 10 Oaks? Like who, the top agents are what? The ones who show up. The ones who show up. That's right. And do the work. I mean, and that's true of pretty much any business. I mean, showing up's half the battle. It's, I'm more than half the battle. Um, it's be, it's surrounding yourself with people who are swimming in the same direction as you and, and putting yourself in those environments. Yeah. Okay. Enough about me. Time to talk about your origin story. Yeah. So, um, completely different stories. Uh, very, very different stories. I'm, I'm originally from Nashville, so, um, I'm, I'm back, uh, where I started. Um, but I went off to college at the university of Mississippi, met my wife early on there, uh, freshman year, actually. Um, she and I started dating, dated throughout college. Um, after I guess my junior year, I got a internship to go work for a casino company, Caesars entertainment. Um, very, very cool company, uh, doing a lot of like cutting edge stuff on the technology side, which was fun. Yeah. And um, I'm sure with Caesars, you had the money to do it. Oh yeah. Yeah. They could s spend more money than, than any other company I'd ever been with. And, and they treated their employees very fairly. It was, it was really a great company to work for. And they asked me to leave college and come to work full time. And I was like, uh, I really need to get my degree. Like, I just felt like that was important. I was you know, very, very close anyway. I think I had just maybe eight or so hours left. Well, you're being modest now. They offer you, between your junior and senior year, they offered you a certain income, which would have been tempting at the time, which was? Yeah, it was It was about 150000 to come work full-time. Right, like, and right you hadn't even gate. finished college. I hadn't even finished college. Yeah. Um, and I, I turned them down, but, I, you know, I said I love the company. I love what I was doing here. I'd be interested to come back. And and sure enough, they, they said, well, wait. So... Went back, finished college, um, came to work for, for, at the time, it was actually Harris Entertainment. They got taken private by Apollo and then bought by Caesars. But um, I was working for them. We were in, in all kinds of departments. So I started off working on Harris.com, the online uh, hotel booking platform. Uh, then I kind of moved over into a product they called Total Rewards, where you have a, a card and you go check your points and see yeah. if you get free stays at hotels. And we built those kiosks. Um, then we worked on some GPS technology that kind of tracked where you were in the casino. Um, you know, at the time, like this stuff is cutting edge, you know, you're, you're talking 2004 or five. Yeah. Well, and I think about it, it's like, yeah, what do you think that the casino technology is like these days? Oh, like they've I, yeah. got your number, I promise you. Yeah. And so, you know, we're working on that. And then, uh, then I got moved into analytics. So we were, you know, running big data, um, big data warehouse, uh, for Caesars, um, running customer analytics, figuring out, what games they play, how the locations of the, fa the uh, facilities should be laid out. Uh, just really interesting work. Mm -hmm. But all the while, my wife is in med school in Mississippi. Um, I'm traveling back and forth between Las Vegas and Atlantic City every weekend. Um, you know, it's just me. So I'm, I'm working. I'm getting promoted. I've gotten promoted uh, by this point maybe three or four times. Right. Um, doing, doing pretty well at the organization. But I was like, I don't want to raise a family in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, I I love Las Vegas. I love to visit Las Vegas. Um, I just, I really wanted to get back to Nashville. So I really, you know, I opened up the Rolodex, uh, looked through my contacts. Uh, again, I was from Nashville, so I had several. And uh, I, you know, I started making phone calls. Like, what, what are you up to now? Like, and I really wanted to get into healthcare because healthcare was blowing up in Nashville. Right. Um, it was the, if you were going to be in Nashville, um, whether it be in technology or healthcare leadership or whatever, like healthcare was the industry. So, um, it turns out one of my, 
the guys I graduated high school with, his dad had started uh, a behavioral healthcare company business. And uh, they were really small at the time. Mm -hmm. But I knew this guy and I was like, he's he's going places. So I, I kind of aligned myself with him, um, came back and I was a, an architect for them, um, a technology architect for them. And, you know, kept getting promoted there as well and worked my way up into an executive leadership position on the IT side. And that company got acquired. Uh, so they were relocated to King of Prussia, Pennsylvania. And I was like, I, I worked for them for a while remotely. Um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, I, I like to be in the mix. Like right. I don't, I don't like to be in this remote uh, location that, that doesn't see corporate or doesn't get to inter intermingle with the different people in the different departments. So left that organization and, and the guy that started the company that I went to work for in Nashville started another company called Acadia Healthcare, um, in Franklin and, uh, same, same line of business, behavioral healthcare and, um, ended up being the CIO for them for a while. Um, uh, I'm still consulting for them now, actually. Um, but all the while, I'm, I'm doing all this uh, work on the technology side. My wife and I got started uh, in real estate back in 2008, you know, same yeah. same as you, uh, but on the investment side. So we were buying properties uh, with any spare income we had, just holding them. And uh, we bought long-term rentals, short-term rentals, uh, midterm rentals for traveling nurses, um, and just kept amassing these properties um, and we're always very interested in real estate. You Can you share a little bit about your philosophy there? Because you, you told me this before, because when you were starting to get in real estate investing, you were like, ah, you know, you, you sort of didn't know what you were doing, but you sort of had this philosophy around getting started. Yeah. So it's, it's not a popular one. Um, it worked for me and, and I guess, you know, we could have turned back time and it, it may not have worked, but for me, I didn't, I didn't care if I broke even. I wasn't looking at the numbers and say, I need X, Y, Z return. I, I, if, if it, the bills were paid from the rent, mm -hmm. I was banking on appreciation. Right. And I was planning to hold these properties for as long as I could, um, or as long as I needed to, uh, for that appreciation to work itself out. And it just so happened that I was buying properties when, you know, a lot of the values had tanked right. luckily. Right. So my first, I don't know, maybe five properties, were significantly undervalued mm -hmm. at that point, um, just coming off the heels of that last recession. Well, but I like the overall philosophy of, you know, and I sort of feel that way in, in real estate generally. It's, it, you know, again, like we talked about at the beginning, it's like just get started because you're going to learn. Look, here's a reality in real estate. You are going to pay for your education. Yes. Right now, you may not have to like pull it out of your, you know, actual bank account, but you're going to pay for it and you know, mistakes, lost deals, lost, you know, failure to, to be able to close a client, whatever the case may be, you're going to pay for your, for your education in real estate period. And then you're going to pay five times what you'd spend on a university education, but that's just part of the process. And it sounds like you kind of had that mentality going into investing. Absolutely. And, and for every mistake I made, I, I bought a property that, you know, did really, really well. So, you know, you, you, the, the key is learning from them. You know, you, you, you have to do it, and a lot of these, in a lot of these cases, you have to make that mistake yourself before you really get it. Mm -hmm. um, and and real estate's that way. I mean, for selling real estate, like you, you're going to go into your first deal, and you're not going to know anything, and you're going to be afraid that hey, you know, I'm going to make a mistake, and everybody's going to find me out, and and they're going to think I'm I'm not a real agent, or they're not going to use me again. Everybody's making these mistakes, right. um, and every deal you're learning something. There there are deals that you and I oversee or we do ourselves now that we learn things from. Yeah. Um, and it's the people that aren't learning that, that probably aren't going too far in real estate. Yeah, absolutely. So, so back to your sort of journey and you, so you've gotten into investing and so you've picked up some properties along the, along the way. Um, so start, start from there. Yeah. So, um, amass these properties over time. We still, we still buy, we don't buy as often anymore. We've, we've kind of got our portfolio. I mean, we, there are opportunities that, that come across my desk that, um, mainly now it's like, Hey, there's this complex that's going to be built out in West Nashville and it's not going to be done for three years. And we're pre-selling them now for, you know, 
three hundred thousand, and they're gonna, you know, when we go live with them, they're gonna start at three eighty five. Or so you, you know, all you got to do is put a down payment in, and you're gonna bank at least eighty, ninety thousand. And those aren't, those aren't, they're pretty few, few and far between. But I will look at those obviously because it's kind of a no brainer. I mean, you, again, like it's not even you're not even closing on this thing for three years. So you, right. you, you have to hope that there's gonna be some level of appreciation there when, when it does close. And then obviously you got to decide, hey, I'm going to hold this thing or I'm going to sell it and pay the capital gains now. Um, so we did that uh, for a long time. And then I'm like, you know, if if I'm going to be this invested from a personal finance standpoint, from a time and, and money standpoint on on real estate, then maybe this should just be something that I do full time. And I, I always knew that the corporate world wasn't for me long term. Mm-hmm. Like I, it, I, I love my technology leadership positions and my roles. And I love, you know, being an executive at a large fortune 500 company, but you know, there, there are challenges there too. I mean, you're dealing with publicly traded companies, you're dealing with boards, you're dealing with, um, you know, in a lot of cases you want to affect change and you can't because you're constrained by all these different, um, you know, things within the organization because they're publicly traded and I just wanted more control. And so, you know, at this point I'm, I'm looking for, for a smaller, uh, maybe start up real estate company that um, I can come and be a big part of and and help grow. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, where RL and I meet and I'll tell the story from my perspective. So, you know, basically, um, you know, we're, we're in, you know, February of 2020 and the pandemic is on and I've just started a real estate company. I'm brand new into it. We, um, you know, have gotten, you know, uh, about a hundred thousand dollars from a couple of investors to just kick this thing off. And and I had, had just been coming off of uh, another real estate company. So I had experience in the industry. Um, but that just hit, I mean, like a ton of bricks, you know, it's like, okay, what's going to happen with the real estate market. And I remember talking to my staff. So I had, you know, a couple of brokers, I had a broker in Oklahoma, I had a broker in Texas. I had, you know, three or four staff members. And I said, okay, and, and I remember asking the question like, okay, are, are we going to do this? Like, I just want to give everybody the opportunity to like, get out. <laughs> say no now. If you <laughs> yeah, exactly. Say, yeah. Say no now if you want. And, and, um, you know, fortunately I surrounded myself with some amazing people and they're like, no, we're in, let's do this. And I said, okay, well, this is going to suck. Um, but let's recruit our way through it. Like it, it, there's no, there's no way in which this is not going to be difficult, but let's take action. Right, let's take as much action as we can. Let's work really, really hard, and at least we gave it our best shot. And so I started holding these. Um, you know, I would post on Indeed and funnel people to a recruiting uh, webinar that I would have. I was doing them twice a day, so I'd do two on Tuesday, two on Wednesday, two on Thursday. And I remember, so I, I had this one. Um, there's this guy RL Hessen that shows up, and um, so you know. Typically in these meetings, like I, I sort of pick people off that are, you know, pretty interesting people. And I say, Hey, RL, can you hang on for a second? And, um, so I said, what do you do for a living? And he says, I'm the CIO for Acadia health. And I go, okay. And so in my mind, I'm going like, why is he here? (laughs) Number one. And then I, I sort of felt this need to be transparent. I said, Hey, I just want you to know, like we're a startup. Like we, we just got started. He goes, yeah, yeah, I know. And, um, I said, great. And, and, you know, within, I, I mean, my sort of perception was like, this guy's never joined into notes. It's like, we're too new. Um, you know, he, he, there's not enough, um, uh, uh, we, we don't have really a, a reputation in, in Franklin or in Tennessee or anywhere, right? Nobody even knows who we are. And so I thought, well, we're not going to be, you know, far enough along for RL to want to join us. Then before we know it, he's licensed. Uh, he starts selling property. And I said, you know, hey, let's uh, let's go to dinner. Um, and he goes, yeah, absolutely. So we we ended up having a dinner and and uh, talking through it. And and I remember the moment where I said, hey, man, I said, I'd love to have your help building this. And you said, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. So I'd love to hear it from your side. Yeah. Um, it's funny how we, we both have two two different perspectives on the matter. So I did show up to that, that webinar. I, that's not really the way I wanted to kind of interview. I I was interviewing you as probably as much as you were interviewing me. It's not really the way I wanted to 
uh, kind of go about it, but that was the way you guys were doing things. And, and, uh, so I did show up, but I was calling really every brokerage in town to the, the smaller ones to try to see kind of where they were at, what they were doing. And, and there were several that I knew that, Hey, th- these weren't a good fit. Like I knew village already had like a group of leadership, um, that had owned the company and, and like, that's not a good fit. I, I was looking for somewhere like, again, where I could go and I could affect change. I could be a part of the organization, um, maybe, you know, have some potential ownership stake at some point, but just be a large part of the organization. So I wasn't looking at the benchmarks or the parks or all the, all these other places that were already well established. I was looking at the places, uh, you know, that were smaller and, and most of those were advertising part-time agents, which you guys were doing. Right. So, uh, I interviewed you and I was just really drawn to you. I, I, uh, I liked the way you phrased things. I believed in your energy. I really just, I don't know what it was and I'll never know. Um, but we had that conversation and obviously you thought it went pretty well. I, I thought it went pretty well. And I just walked away from it. Like, I don't need to call like at this point I'd probably called, I don't know, maybe had a eight or so different calls with different brokerages. I was like, I don't, I don't need to call anymore. And I went home and I told my wife, I was like, I think I found the place I want to be. Um, it's just going to depend on if they want me there. And, um, we went to that dinner and, you know, and our, our conversations continued and, and I kind of felt the same way each time we spoke. I just felt like you and I were on the same page. We, I wouldn't say we, we have the same way of thinking. I don't think that's true at all. No. I think me, you and I are very different people. We have very different skill sets. We have very different qualities. Um, but I think that's what kind of attracted me is like, Hey, like, I really feel like he's, he's got, um, some qualities and some aspects to him that are definitely my weaknesses. And I've got these things over here that are maybe kind of in your blind spots and it just worked. And, and, but not only that, we, we got along, like yeah. that's, that's key is like you, you have to get along. Right. Um, yeah. So it, it was a super unique, uh, experience and, and, um, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Um, all right. So let's, um, let's transition here and talk about, um, you know, moving forward and, and what is this residential real estate thing and what are we, um, you know, as we're teaching agents and we're, we're communicating to them strategies on, on being successful in real estate. And one of the first things I want to talk about is, is mindset. Like how does this, you know, how do you need to be thinking when you're getting into real estate and, and how do you need to understand the real estate business as a whole? And this is where I get a lot of you know, people come into this business with a certain, um, you know, preconceived notion about how this thing works. And often they're, you know, maybe a little misguided or, or, you know, they've, they've watched too much, um, selling sunset or whatever, right? Because real estate is fun and exciting and they make shows about it, but there's a reality to it that a lot of people don't get. And, And the first thing is, is that mindset piece, like how you need to come into this business and think about, um, being successful in real estate. And what I hear a lot is people will come to me cause I'm, I'm interviewing new agents all the time. Like one of my main, the main portions or the main hats that I wear is, is recruiter, right? A recruiter, trainer, coach. And, you know, people will come to me in that, that interview, uh, process and say, well, I, I want to do it this way. You know, I, I don't want a cold call. Um, I don't want to, um, you know, talk to people I haven't talked about. I just want to leverage my network or, you know, any, any number of strategies that they've sort of preconceived. Like I just want to have parties and invite people to these parties and then I'm going to meet them. They're going to want to buy a house for me. And it doesn't work that way. Never. Right. And, and, you know, I, I saw a, a coach that I follow. He said, listen, if you're not willing to make cold calls, find a different business. And, and I think people have this notion that, that I'm going to come into this. I'm going to get my business cards. I'm going to hand them out to everybody I know. Uh, by the way, when you're going through real estate school, um, you're hearing all of the real estate deals that are going on around you. And you're going, hey, this is great. I'm going to cash in on all of this business that's already happening around me. And the reality of it is the people that are in your network initially aren't going to use you. They are, this is the, the, you know, a house 
And by the way, this is not, I, I'm making a, a generalized statement. Um, I realize that, but most people have not worked their way up to the level of professionalism in that particular industry for people to go, yeah, hang on, you're new in this business. Let me give you the most expensive thing that I've ever bought. And I want you to sell it for me and make me the most amount of money. No offense to you. They may know you, they may like you, but they don't necessarily trust you with that yet. And so you have to go through this process of building rapport in your network before your network uses you. And that's been my experience with coaching agents is like, look, you have to be willing to go out and build a new network and then your network comes into play. Yeah. And, and a lot of times people treat it, um, especially in the South, I feel like as like a privacy thing, like they don't want, I don't want Brandon to know how much money I make, what right. my credit score is. And, and that's all with the lender, but people associate the the entire purchase with the real estate agent. So they think, oh, he's going to see how much money I make and he's going to see all these things. And, and, you know, I, I think they get worried about using their friends in those scenarios. That, that's absolutely right. And and so there's a multitude of reasons. So if, if you're coming in this business thinking, like, I'm just going to cash in on my network, I, I hate to tell you this, you're probably, unless you're a, in a 2% category, you're probably wrong. And you're probably going to have to build this with talking to and having conversations with people that you haven't had conversations with before. Yeah. Plain and simple. And, um, so your mindset again, going into this is, you know, and, and by the way, I don't tell you that to discourage you. I tell that, I tell that to you, to be real with you, to be transparent with you. And so that you'll realize, Hey, this is, uh, this is a process of developing a new skill set, of developing a new, um, uh, ability to be able to converse with people that I haven't talked about before and, and to convey value and the relationship. Yeah. Um, but the minds, again, the mindset going into this is, you know, and I think the other thing is people might have limiting beliefs, um, you know, where they're like, well, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to be good at this particular thing, or I, you know, I'm not going to be good at cold calls, or I'm not going to be good at, um, you know, the sort of transaction management piece of that. And, and so I would, I would encourage you to dump those limiting beliefs and to charge forward with sort of a new way of thinking and a new way of, of shaping your mindset. And look, the other thing is like, there are humans that do this and are very successful about it. Find out what they're doing and duplicate it. Yeah. it it's not rocket science. There's a lot of people that just don't treat it like a business. They think, Oh, um, I've got a friend in real estate. He's been in real estate for a while and he plays golf on Wednesdays and, you know, does this on Thursdays and you're like, all right, well, that's easy. Like, I don't even have to work. And like these houses just get sold. Like <laughs> yeah. it's, it, it's a lot of work. Yeah. Never mind that that guy's five years into the business and spent the first two years calling for sell by owners every single day and setting up appointments. Yeah. Right. It looks easy from the outside looking in, but it's not in reality. And there is a period in your life where referral business will come and that's, that business is easier to acquire, but that we're talking years down the road. Yeah. Exactly. And so listen, real estate is three things. Residential real estate is three things. Number one, it's lead generation or business development. How are you bringing new business into the mix? And I don't care what kind of business you have, whether you're a dry cleaner, a gas station, a doctor, whatever the case is, your number one job. And by the way, if you have not read the book E-Myth, you need to read that book. Uh, but your number one job is sourcing new business, lead generation, business development, getting people to use you. Because if you don't have customers, you don't have anything. And this podcast is going to be a lot about lead generation. We'll yeah. probably have several different episodes on lead generation. But, you know, early on, it's not the what you think. It's not the I'm going to buy leads from XYZ company. Right. Because early on, that's not you're not getting the revenue from the business. So you're not investing in the business. So you've got to make those calls. Like, you, what, what do we teach at 10 Oaks? Like, where do we start? Yeah. Well, I mean, we're starting with the the transactional lead sources. And, and we're going to get into that too. Um, but you know, the other the second part of this job is customer service. Um, and I think this is where I think real estate agents think this is the job, which is showing houses, going on listing appointments, uh, doing the contract. Um, and that's where I find the most, uh, the, the, the biggest amount of misconception is that, that that's what they think it is driving people around all day and showing them houses and doing contracts. It's not, that is probably 
you know, anywhere, depending on, on how far you are, are along in your career, it's anywhere from 30 to 50% of the business is, is that sort of customer service portion. Um, so that, that's the, the job is getting new business, not necessarily customer service. Um, so there's the customer service piece, which is the showing houses. And then the third thing is the transaction management, right? And that is the, all the paperwork and the back and forth of, you know, talking to, you're basically the air traffic controller for the deal, right? You're talking, you've got a lender, you got a title company, you got an inspector, you got an appraiser, right? And so you've got all of these sort of, you know, planes coming in and you've got to direct them in the right way. And so it's just understanding, you know, you're wearing three different hats and knowing which one you need to focus on to be the most successful. Absolutely. And at 10 Oaks, we, we have our agents use a transaction coordinator, which yeah. certainly helps them get off the ground because that's just taking that piece of the business for now off their plate so that they can worry about, you know, lead generation and closing the deal. That's the number one thing I tell all agents. I, I honestly, like if you're starting out and, and by the way, I've heard every excuse in the book, like, well, I like, I like to manage my deals. Like I, I want to know what's going on. I feel like I, I'm not doing a good service to my clients if I'm not doing the transaction coordination. And that's just simply not true. You're too distracted um, with all of those things going on. You need a professional in place, yeah. right? If you're going to build your business the right way. So that's the first thing I would absolutely say is to get off your plate is, is the transaction coordination and all the sort of organizational pieces. Um, and, and that's true of all your partners. Yeah. Like you want... You want a good lender that you don't have to worry about. You yeah. don't have to worry if the appraisal is going to get ordered. You sure. don't have to worry about anything getting dropped along the way. So you want a good lender. You want a good title company that's going to get docs out. Right. Um, you know, it, it's all those partners you're surrounding yourself with are hyper important for you to close these deals right. on time right. and, you know, smoothly. Right. And so, yeah, that's, those are, those are the three hats is, is again, um, you know, custom or lead generation rather. So biz, lead generation or business development, um, customer service, and then transaction management. Anything else you want to say on that? No. Okay. No. All right. Well, um, just thinking through on this first episode, because I think we've gone a little while here. Yeah, 37 right? minutes. 37 minutes. All right, that's yeah. not bad. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, do you think anything else we need to cover in this episode? I don't think so. Okay. I think I uh, gave him a good introduction to what we're about yeah. and... Um, you know, we're going to try to do this weekly, so we'll, we'll get on it. Fantastic. Well, we'll see you guys on the next episode.